Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is National Master Optane, and welcome to the Beginner's Breakdown. Today, we're going to take a dive into the concept of decoys. So to illustrate, let's take a look at this position from 1983 versus Varsity and Holgar. So what is a decoy? A decoy is a tactic that lures a piece away from its square and its job. So let's evaluate this position quickly. So black has one, two, three, four, five pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. So white is up a pawn. Both sides have their rooks, both sides have minor pieces, and both sides respectively have their queens. So what we can notice in this position is that Polgar would love to take this rook on b4. But unfortunately, white has this rook on a2 that can capture the rook on a8. And if we do a count here, the material is equivalent but we don't really gain any significant advantage in this position. So what we want to try to do here is kind of lure the piece away that's protecting this rook that's on a2. So when we capture on b4, if we were to try to take this rook, the queen would be protecting it. So what Polgar did in this position was to move bishop all the way to c4. And now bishop to c4 is a fork, so it attacks two or more pieces at the same time. It attacks the queen and it attacks the rook. So if the queen moves away, then we can safely capture the rook. And if the rook moves away, then we can capture the queen. So queen takes c3, looks like a free bishop. But here and now, we can play pawn takes b4. And as we take this pawn on b4, it is now attacking this queen on c3. So if black tries to capture our rook on a8, we can capture the queen and we will be up a queen for a knight here. So if white tries to, let's say, play queen c2 to protect the rook on a2, we can simply just trade off rooks and after the queen takes, we are up the exchange. So queen for queen, bishop for bishop, and we have a rook for a knight in this position. So we are up the material here. So let's take a look at some examples here. All right, 1978, we have Edgar versus Fromlet. So white to move and create a decoy in order to gain an advantage here. So let's evaluate this position. White has one, two, three, four pawns. Black also has one, two, three, and four pawns. Both sides have their rooks, and both sides have their knights. So what we can notice here is that this knight on g3 is kind of putting a little pressure onto this pawn on f5. But unfortunately for white, this black king is defending f5. So we can't really capture on f5, otherwise the king would take back here. So we need to find a move that kind of lures the king away so we can safely capture this pawn on f5. So we typically want to look for some active moves. They include checks, captures, or threats. So the ideal move in this position would be bringing our rook all the way to d6, so attacking the king on e6. So this rook on d6 is completely undefended. So it looks like black can actually capture this rook on d6 completely for free. But that serves our whole idea of playing rook to d6, which is to kind of lure the king away from protecting this pawn on f5. So there is no pawn, there, the king is no longer protecting this pawn on f5. So what white can do is safely capture on f5 with a check so now this move is a tactic. It creates a fork. So it attacks the king and it attacks the rook at the same time. So once the king, let's say, moves away to e6, we can happily just capture out the rook on h6. And if we do a count, white has one, two, three, four. Black has one, two, three. 
and both sides have their knights, so white is up a pawn. So the whole idea of this combination was to win a pawn, which, would satis which will pretty much satisfy us in this endgame here. And in addition to rook to d6 check, there are a couple options black could play. They could also play a move like king e7, which probably isn't the best idea because you can just capture on f5. And not only does it attack the king on e7, it protects the rook on d6, and it attacks the rook on h6. So once black moves out the way from the check, we can happily capture the rook on h6 here. And last but not least, let's say if the king goes to f7, we can pick up the pawn on f5, and we should have a pretty clean endgame being up a pawn. All right, how about we take a look at the next one? So, 1975, we have Parkesi versus Ederly. So, white to move and create a decoy here. Find a decoy. So, it's always good to evaluate the position first. So, let's do a material count for both sides. So, white has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns. So seven is bigger than six, so black is up a pawn here. And we have, both sides have a rook, both sides have a queen, and in addition here, looks like black is at a more advantage in material because they have a rook for the bishop, so they are up the exchange. So what we could also notice here in this position is that there's a bit of tension from the C1 diagonal all the way to the F4 diagonal. So both the queens are eyeing each other down. So if white is careless and let's say plays a move like bishop to F3, then black could capture this queen on F4 completely for free. And let's say if black makes a move, and we can capture their queen on c1, they can easily just recapture back on c1. So that's kind of the big idea in this position. So we notice that there's some tension between the queens. The queen on f4 is unprotected, and the queen on c1 is protected here. So Aska in the chat says rook check. So I'm assuming that would be rook to g8 check. And I think that move is perfect. So with this move, rook to g8 check, black has two options here. They could either capture it with the rook, or they can capture it with the king. Let's just take a look what happens if the rook captures. If the rook captures the rook on g8, then the queen on f4 will capture the queen on c1, because the rook is no longer on c8, so it's no longer protecting the queen, so white has gotten away with capturing a queen for a rook. So white has a queen and bishop for two rooks. So plenty of material there. So with rook to g8, what happens if the king captures on g8? Fortunately for us, we have a very strong active move here. So we kind of lured the king out of its comfort, its little home in the corner on h8. So what we can do here is play this move queen to g3 check. So the only safe check for us in this position. We can't play queen to g4 because the pawn's covering, and we can't play queen to g5 because the queen on c1 is covering that square. So queen to g3 check is the move. And now black has two choices, technically three, but if you block with the queen, we'll simply take. So two main choices here. Either black goes home with king to h8, back to the corner, or the black king can go to f8. If the king goes to h8, we can play queen to g7, checkmate, as the pawn on f6 is protecting this queen on g7, and the queen covers all the squares that the king can go to and attack the king. If the king goes to f8, then we can still play queen to g7, but it's not yet mate because the black king can go to e8, and then we can now do checkmate, either with queen to g8 checkmate or queen to h8 checkmate. Both moves get the job done.
Perfect. All right, how about this example here? So 1969, we have Brewstead versus Braemere. White to move and find the decoy. So we want to find moves that essentially kind of lure one of our opponent's pieces in, and then we could take advantage of that. So let's evaluate this position. Let's do a material count. So white has one, two, three, four pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five pawns. So it looks like black is up a pawn here. Both sides have their queen and a rook, respectively. And the imbalance here is that white has a bishop for a knight. So they're equal, but different pieces here. So now what we want to try to do is find a way to, in order, uh, find a way to distract one of black's pieces in order to gain an advantage here. So a big thing I'd also like to notice here is that the placements of the kings. So our king on h2, it's pretty safe. We have a fortress with a bishops and pawns. And in addition, it has some safe squares to run away to. Unlike the black king on h6, it is completely trapped by its own pieces and our rook is covering h7 and g7 here. So in the chat, we have Abraham who says queen takes h5 check. Ooh, we're sacrificing our queen. So queen takes h5 check, that forces black to capture our queen. Black has no other legal move. And then and now, we can finally play this move, rook to h7, and this would be checkmate. So it attacks the king, covers h6, and our pawn on h3 and g3 are doing a wonderful job covering g4 and h4. And the pawn and knight are covering black squares, so that is checkmate. So originally, we couldn't play a move like rook to h7 beforehand because black would simply capture and this move order would let black have a significant advantage. So hence why we captured on h5 first, distracting the king from guarding this h7 square. So once the king takes, then we can now provide checkmate with rook to h7. All right, we're on a roll. Let's take a look at the next position. So. 1974, we have Britt Norris versus Goodman. White to move here. So it's always good to do a material count. So white has one, two, three, four pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five pawns. So black is up a pawn. Both sides respectively have their rooks, a queen, and they have the imbalance of the knight for the bishop here. All right. So what we can notice here in this position is that there's a lot of stuff going on on the e-file here. So we have our rooks, both our rooks on the e-file, so we call that a battery. So a battery is two or more pieces controlling a file, rank, or diagonal together. And in this case, both the rooks are on the same file and just creating a strong control over this e-file. So maybe we can keep that in our mind. And in addition, we should also take a look at a black's king. It is very vulnerable. It has absolutely no squares to go to. So the bishop covers f8, our queen on f6 covers g7, and it covers h8. So no squares for the king to go to. So. In the chat, we have TW suggesting queen to h8 check. So we're giving our queen away, and that forces black to capture our queen. So then and now, we can play this move bishop to f6 with a check here, attacking the king. And as you can notice, everything is forced, so black has to go back to the square that it came from. So king to g8. And then and now we can deliver checkmate by bringing our rook all the way from e2 to e8, covering the f8 square, attacking the king on g8, and covering h8, alongside with the bishop, covering the g7 square. So that is checkmate. All right, 
Next position, we have a position from 1991, Hoiberg versus Pakagansi. So white to move and create a decoy. So we're getting the pattern of distracting, luring black's pieces or our opponent's pieces into squares where we can take advantage of that in this position. So as always, let's take a quick material count. So white has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns as well. So both sides are equivalent pawn-wise. And both sides have two rooks and both sides have their bishop here. And last but not least, both sides do have their queens here. So a good thing to take into account here is that black uh, is attacking our queen on d4. So that kind of gives us a little bit of a hint that maybe we want to try to utilize our queen in order to gain an advantage here. So a lot of us in the chat are saying queen takes bishop. And I couldn't agree anymore. Queen takes bishop on d7, attacking the king. So black has two options here. They could either capture the queen on d7, or they could simply slide their king to f8, which is probably the best choice for black. But in this case, let's just say black does capture on d7. So now, since this king is on d7, it is actually lined up with our rook on d1. But we just have this bishop on d3 blocking our way. So now, our job here is to find a move where we could place this bishop so we can uncover this rook from attacking the king. And this tactic would be called a discovery. So what's a good square for our bishop? So we have the move bishop to b5, double check. Not only does a rook attack the king, also the bishop on b5. So whenever a king is in double check, they have to move their king. They can't block it, or, and they can't capture the check here. So with bishop to b5 check here, it covers the e8 square, so the king cannot go there. And it looks like black's only move is to play king to c8, as our bishop on e5 is covering the e2 square, uh, c7 square, excuse me. And the rook is just dominating the d file. And now here, we can deliver the final blow. So notice that our rook on the d file is covering d8 and d7, our bishop on e5 is covering c7 and b8. So all we need to do is find a move that attacks the king on c8 and its safe square, b7. So what could that move possibly be? And the correct solution would be bishop to a6, finishing off the game, attacking the king on c8. Bishop once again covers c7 and b8 and our rook dominating the d file. Excellent. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Position from 1990, Holschner versus Bezener. So black to move and create a decoy. So getting the pattern of distracting our opponent's pieces and then fully taking advantage of them. So let's evaluate this position. Black has one, two, three, four, five pawns. <laughs> Black has, uh, excuse me, white has one, two, three, four, five pawns as well. So both sides are equivalent pawn wise. Both sides have a queen, a rook, both sides have a light square bishop. And the imbalance here is that black has a dark square bishop for a knight. So we should also take into account kind of the king safety of both sides. So. Both, so our king on f7 is a little bit exposed. It has some squares that go to, and preferably we would like to have it sheltered by pieces. So maybe the king would probably prefer to be on h8, covered by the rook and bishop. But our king is pretty open. And now for white, they're 
kind of enclosed, they're kind of safe, but they only really have one safe square to go to, which is g2, because our queen on c5 is covering the g1 square. So maybe we could try to take advantage of white's king here, as a lot of white's pieces are kind of in the center or on the queen side here. So what would our decoy be? What would our little distraction be here? So a lot of us in the chat says queen to g1 with a check. So we're giving black, uh, excuse me, white a whole queen. So with queen to g1 check, that forces white to capture the queen. And now we can deliver kind of the same idea that we did from last uh, uh, puzzle here. So what would that be? So bishop to d4 here would be our move here. And the idea being is that the rook is attacking the king and in addition the bishop is attacking the king. So it is a double check. So once again, whenever a king is in double check, they have to move away. They can't block the check, they can't capture the check because there's two pieces attacking the king. So now once the king runs away to the corner, to h1, then we can deliver the final blow of checkmate with the rook to g1 checkmate as the bishop on d4 supports the rook into attacking the king and covering the g2 square. All right, sounds good. Let's go on to the next one. So, white to move in this position. From 1991, Oltin versus Mezazaros here. So, it's always good to do a material count. White has one, two, three, four, five pawns. Black has one, two, three, four four pawns, so white is up a pawn. Both sides have their queens, both sides have their rooks, and both sides have a knight, light square bishop, and dark square bishop here. So we can prob probably notice a big thing in this position. And this king, uh, our opponent's king, the black king, is all the way from a6. So it went from e8 all the way to e to a6 somehow. So looks like we want to utilize that advantage of just pushing the king all the way to the queen side. So what could we possibly do here? So the king has no safe, safe squares to go to. So a5, b6 is covered by our knight, and b7 and b5 are covered by our bishop. And we would love to kind of bring the final hammer to black, but we kind of do have some pieces in the way. They're not fully coordinated. So what could we possibly do in this position? So in the chat, we have the suggestion of bishop to b7 check. Wow. Okay, so with bishop to b7 check, that forces black to play the only move, which is to capture the bishop on b7. And once a black captures on b7, we can deliver the final blow of queen to a4. So this bishop on c6 was in the way of this, bishop, of this queen from going to a4. So what we needed to do was kind of move the bishop aside. So kind of uh, remove it from allowing the queen from going to a4, and it kind of distracts black. It kind of forces black to capture uh, b7 with the queen, and this queen now moves. So we don't really have to worry about protecting the b7 square because it's covered by a queen. So queen to a4 would be checkmate as it attacks the king, covers the b5 square, and our knight on b6 does, a uh, knight on c4 does a wonderful job protecting the b6 square. Very nice. All right, how about this position? 
So, we have a position from 1990 between Luther versus Mayer. So, white to move and create a decoy. So, create some sort of distraction in order to gain a full advantage here. So, let's take a quick evaluation here. So, white has one, two, three, four, five pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. So, black is up a pawn. And both sides have a queen and a rook. So, what could we possibly do here in this position? Okay, so we have the move rook to h8 check. Very nice. So, with rook to h8 check, that forces the king to capture on h8. But when, when that king moves away, it stops protecting this h6 pawn. Excellent. So the queen will just capture on h6, and after the king goes to g7, we can play queen to g7, checkmate, protected and supported by the pawn on f6. Now, that is a good solution, but there is a faster solution. So we always want to find the fastest way to get to our destination. We would rather take a quicker route than a long route. Three plus one, okay, very nice. So it looks like we just had to swap our move order. So queen to h6 this time instead of rook to h8. So after queen takes h6, that forces black to take and then we can slide a rook all the way to h8. Bam, checkmate. Pawn, cov pawn on h4 covers the g5 square. Our pawn on f6 covers the g7 square. And our rook covers h7 and h5 and also attacking the king. So this actually took two moves with queen takes on h6 and rook to h8. And the other move order took three moves. So either one works, but it's, all, it's always good to be more productive and efficient by going for the quicker uh, execution here. So let's take a look at a couple more, and then we'll go on to a game. So in this position from 1943, we have Thelaton versus Chodera, and it is white to move here. So it's always good to do a quick evaluation. We have one, two, three, four, five, six pawns for white, and black has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns. So black is up a pawn. Both sides have a queen. Both sides have their rooks, and both sides have a knight and a bishop here. So we can notice that white is following more of the middle game principles as this rook on d1 is controlling the d-file, and rooks love open files. So any time you can get your rook to an open file, do it. And white is doing an excellent job doing that. So full control, maybe they can place pieces on the d-file as it would be supported by the rook. And in addition, white has a piece in the center, so looking really good here. So now it is our job as white to find a decoy here. So kind of distract black, kind of lure him into a trap, and then try to take full advantage of that. So. Knight to f6 check. Ooh, that's pretty tricky. Knight to f6 check. And you're saying, if you try to take my knight on f6, you're going to take my bishop. Oh, boy. Well, sure, that looks good. And let's say I play something like rook a to b8. If we kind of do a quick little material count as previously, the imbalance here is that there's a bishop for a knight, queen for queen. Both sides have their rooks. And black has seven pawns, while white has six pawns. So there's still added advantage here. 
So whenever we have tactics, we want to fully utilize them and kind of flourish the idea of gaining a full advantage here. So in the chat, we have a very tactical move. Rook to Ah, rook to d7, yes. So with rook to d7, it looks like we're just a very nice person today. We're just giving material. But this rook on d7 is poison. So there's a little trap when this rook is captured. So with this rook on d7, it attacks the bishop and the queen at the same time. So we have a fork. So if one of them moves, then we'll capture the other. So for example, let's say the bishop goes to c6. We're going to capture the queen, and we're going to be up a lot of material here. But now the big question arises, what happens if black captures our rook? F6, excellent. So yes, our knight can now hop into the f6 square because previously we can't really play knight f6 because the queen was guarding that square. But as we play rook to d7, we kind of lure the queen away. So now we can freely play knight f6. And now with knight f6, it attacks the queen and the king at the same time. So we have a fork. So once black moves away, we're going to capture the queen, and we are looking very, very good in this position here. So does black have any other options besides capturing the rook? Because if you capture the rook, we notice that there is a fork. So how about queen to e8? I kind of step away from your rook, being a, from your rook attacking my queen. Not f7, that's a long way. But knight to f6, yes, bam. We are still gonna play knight f6. We scared the queen away. So the whole idea was just stopping the queen from guarding this f6 square. So as the queen goes to e8, we play knight to f6 check, king goes to h8, and then bam, we're taking the queen. And unfortunately here, there are no safe squares for black, for the black queen. Rook covers the d8 square, queen, uh, knight covers uh, f6 and g5, and our pawn on g3 covers h4. Perfect. All right, last puzzle here for decoy. We're going to end this puzzle off with a blast. We have a position from 1958. We have Porsche versus Dorier, and it is white to move here. So it's always good to evaluate the position. So white has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. Black has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns. So black is up a pawn. Both sides respectively have their queen, their rooks, and both the bishop pair. So black is just up by a mere pawn, but that is a-okay. Because what white can do here, set up a little trick, and essentially just end the game right there. Mm -hmm. So if we try to capture the bishop here, unfortunately our queen on g4 is unprotected here. So the black queen can just capture on g4 and we traded a queen for a bishop. Not the best idea here. So how about we go for an aggressive move? Let's go all in. We want to try to bring black a little bit forward, and then we want to punish them here. So a lot of us in the chat, I truly couldn't agree anymore and what we want to do is bring our queen and tell the black king on g8, hello. So queen takes g7 face to face with the black king. So that forces the black king to capture the queen on g7. And now 
We've probably seen this pattern a few times in our puzzle today. What could we do here? We could play rook to h5 here because it does kind of attack the king and it attacks the queen. But what black can play is maybe like queen f6. And even if you do this, black is up a whole piece. So both sides have their rooks, both sides have a light square bishop, and black is left over with a dark square bishop. But we can finish this game off right off the bat. Not rook takes bishop. If we do that, then maybe they can just go here. All right, do we see it? Excellent. Bingo. Rook to g5. And it looks like it's a double check, but it's actually checkmate. So we can just say this is double checkmate. So our rook on g5 attacks the king on g7. And in addition, this bishop on c3 attacks the king on g7. Our bishop on d3 covers the h7 square, and our bishop on c3 covers h8 with this rook covering g8. So that is checkmate. Excellent. So I think we are getting a good gist of the concept of decoys. So how about we take a blast in the past and take a look at a game where decoys were involved here. So we're going, to ha we're going to go to the Toph Memorial in 1977. So this game in particular is going to be against Carly Hunphy versus Laslio Barkazi. So a little bit about these players. Carly Hunphy was a Hungarian chess player, and he holds the title of international master. But later on, posthumously, uh, he was awarded the honorary Grandmaster title, and he is playing white in this game. And Lazio Barkazi is black in this game, and he's a Hungarian chess grandmaster. And he has one of the greatest feats in the 1966 Chess Olympiad with a score of 11 out of 12, which allowed him to win the gold medal. So let's take a dive into this position here, into this game. So Hunphy opens the game up with e4, and Barkazi opens the game up with c5. So we have a Sicilian's defense. Knight to f3, we have d6, d4, so striking in the center, captures, knight captures, knight f6, knight c3, everything's pretty much practical. We have a6, so the idea being that black does not want any infiltration of white's pieces coming to b5. And in addition, who knows, maybe black might support b5 themselves. So we have pawn to f4, so kind of, the, kind of following the spear of the Grand Prix attack, or 11 fish. So just immediately pushing pawns on the king's side, trying to be really aggressive when it comes to the Sicilian in the center. So we have queen to b6, so early development in the queen. So just kind of keeping an eye on this knight. And if white sometime in the future tries to castle, there will be this pin here. So white plays knight to b3, and black plays g6. So getting ready to fiend shadow and get their king to safety here. So bishop e2, so standard development, we're looking good. Knight b to d7, and bishop to f3. So we're developing and essentially maneuvering our bishop to uh, be at a better square than it was beforehand. So black plays to move bishop to g7, so fian shadowing the bishop, getting ready to castle here. White plays queen to e2, so moving the queen out the way, maybe white wants to try to castle queenside. And there might be ideas to kind of fully expand on the queen on the center. So castling is played by black here. And then we have g4. So white is really aggressive in this game. So since white has noticed black has castled on the king's side, they're trying to create a pawn storm. So essentially bringing all these pawns to attack where the king is located in order to win the game as quickly as possible. 
So black plays the move e6, so essentially trying to stop ideas like pawn to f5 coming or trying to support d5, typical uh, Sicilian ideas here. So with white plays bishop to e3, so we are developing and, in addition, we're gaining a tempo because this bishop is attacking the queen on b6. So queen has to move, so queen c7 is played. And g5, white is just really aggressive, attacking black, the black knight on f6. All right, black retreats with knight to e8. And in addition, it also activates this bishop. So this bishop is looking really good in this position. So with that in mind, white wants to combat this and plays bishop to d4, trying to offer a trade of the bishops, the less favorable bishop for the more favorable bishop. So black plays e5, does not want to trade today, maybe later, and attacks the bishop and also attacks the pawn on f4 here. So white happily takes, and black decides to take with the knight. So the idea being, wants to try to get this bishop active and able to see here and able to move. So that's probably why black did that instead of capturing with the pawn here. And actually, if capturing with the pawn, there might be some ideas with knight to d5, something scary. So knight e5 is, knight takes e5, and knight to d5 is still played, queen to d8, so kind of have to move the queen away and also guard the e7 square, so got to be a little careful here. And then pawn to h4, so white is still going for the idea of being really, really aggressive and just committing to this pawn storm, trying to attack the king. So Black wants to finish development and just plays bishop to e6. And with bishop to e6, it contributes towards the center and it also attacks this knight on d5. So white finally gets the king to safety and castles long side here. And black notices that the knight on d5 is really, really strong. It can maybe come to b6. Maybe bishop to b6 might be a little bit of a nuisance, so black might as well chip it off. So white captures back, and knight to c7 is played by black. So the knight e on e8 wasn't really doing too much, so it's best to try to bring the knight back into life. So now this knight can maybe have ideas of maneuvering to b5, and kind of also putting a little pressure onto this d5 pawn. So Bishop to e4 is played, so kind of wants to avoid the knight on e5 capturing the bishop, and we're fully centralizing this bishop. So now this bishop has a little bit more visibility when it comes to the king side. So queen e7 is played, so kind of adding more protection, lining up with the queen, and who knows, maybe they might even play rook to e8 and support the e-file. So king b1 is played, always a good precaution move to play whenever you castle queen side. So knight to b5 is played, so bringing the knight back into life and now attacking this bishop on d4. Bishop to f2 is played, so we want to preserve our bishop, kind of have it in our pocket, it could be very useful in the future. And rook f2 e8 is played by black. So they're battering up on the D file and just getting ready to be very solid in this game here. So rook D to E1 is played by white. So also creating a battery and there's a lot of tension going on with the E file here. So F5 played by black. So very aggressive and just wants to create some sort of action in this position. So white could most definitely move their bishop away to g2, but that kind of gives black a lot of space and might even give black the full advantage here. So the best thing to do is 
on Poisson. So we're kind of capture the f5 pawn through the f6 square. And now the queen will take back. So now this is a good thing to keep in mind. So the black queen and the black bishop are creating a battery. So two or more pieces controlling a file, diagonal, or a rank together. And in this case, with the bishop and queen, they're controlling the diagonal from h8 all the way to a1 here. So they have full capitalization on this diagonal. And who knows, there might even be tricks where black can kind of somewhat give up their knight in order to go for this sneaky little checkmate with queen takes b2. So c3 is played. So white's reading black like a book. They see that queen takes b2 is going to be a, pro a little bit of a problem here. So play c3 in order to kind of intervene from black trying to checkmate white on b2. So now we have a little bit of a decoy here, but when it comes to decoy, we want to try to gain full advantage when we use tactics. So knight to c4 was played. And essentially the idea is I want to distract your queen and I'm going to take your bishop on f2 because this queen on e2 is protecting this bishop on f2. So that happened in the game. So queen takes c4 and queen takes f2. So now the queen is on the seventh rank and it's being a bit of a nuisance. So we're going to scare him away. We're going to play rook to e2, scaring the queen away, and the queen goes back to its square on f6. So uh, giving, uh, redoing the battery. So queen to d3 is played in this position. So kind of creating a battery themselves and also in case if the, there's some sort of attack, like let's say rook a c8, it kind of prepares for that. So a little bit of a prophylactic move by queen to d3. And rook a to c8 is played, so trying to find some sort of ideas where it can fully break white. So let's say if white is careless, maybe plays a move like h5, there might be some scary ideas with knight takes c3, pawn takes, rook takes, and there could be some mating nets, or there could be other things around. Maybe knight a3 check is first. But in the game here, white plays this move, pawn to c4. And essentially, what white is trying to say is that I'm trying to fully uh, gain space, attack this knight on b5, and I'm not worried about my b2 pawn at all. There is no checkmate because this rook on e2 is protecting the pawn on b2. But unfortunately here, that proves to be, it shows that c4 is a fatal mistake here. So now, what could black try to do? So we kind of want to influence this combination. So we're going to find a catalyst here. So black to move and kind of take advantage of this mistake that white has played, pushing and advancing this pawn here. So what could we try to do as black? So this pawn on c4 is protected by the queen. So maybe we could ignore that idea. So in the chat, we have some ideas with knight to a3 check. Now, knight to a3 check, not too shabby. But unfortunately here, I believe white could just simply capture this knight. And I think white's pretty solid. There is no mating threat set here. So there's no queen to b2 because of this rook, and there's no queen to a1 because of this knight here. So knight a3, not the best idea, but we can maybe preserve that in our pocket here. Okay. So it looks like 
we have the suggestion of rook takes e4. Interesting. Now, I'm kind of curious what the idea is here. So after rook takes e4, queen takes e4, and rook takes c4. Hmm. So we're being very generous as block today. So we're giving both our rooks. So after that, after queen takes, I think white is just at a huge advantage with plenty of material. And if there is any combination, I think white has enough to compensate for that. So it's a good try, but maybe we're kind of overdoing it. Hmm. OK, so the c4 pawn. It's kind of bugging my mind a little bit here. Sure, it's protected by the queen on d3, but I believe we can follow that up with a combination here. So I want to kind of distract the queen and kind of place it where I can gain, where I can perform a combination here. So we have knight to d4 suggested by chat. And with knight to d4, I would say that's pretty good. But it doesn't really give us a decoy or any sort of advantage. If anything, I think it's more of simplification here. Because let's say knight takes. Queen takes, queen takes, bishop takes. I'll play a move like pawn to b3. I'll have this nice little pawn chain here. And opposite color bishop, so white has the advantage here, but it doesn't really gain an immediate advantage. But I do like the thinking of centralizing the knight and getting away from the threat. So we have sacking the rook okay so we looked at rook takes e4 which doesn't really work but how about the other rook let's try rook takes c4 okay so with rook takes c4 it kind of lures this queen on d3 to capture this rook on c4 because there's absolutely no pieces guarding this rook on c4 so it looks like white can simply capture the rook. But now here we have this nice little forcing move here. So if we can notice here the king and the queen are a knight distance or somewhat of a knight distance away. So if we were to place this knight on a3 we would have a fork. But we can't really play knight to a3 right now because they'll just simply capture our knight and they are just at a huge material advantage here. So that's why queen takes b2 check is our move here. And now with queen takes b2, it looks like that's just a blunder because the whole idea of this rook being on e2 was to protect this pawn. So white could simply just capture on b2. But fortunately for us, not only did we create a decoy, we also removed a defender. So this b2 pawn was protecting the a3 square, but the pawn's no longer there. So now we can play knight to a3 check. So this is what happened in the game. So Borkazi plays rook takes c4, Hanfi takes on c4, and Borkazi plays queen takes b2. So after rook takes, knight to a3, check is played. So a fork attacking the king and the queen at the same time. And that kind of forces white to have only two options here. So either king to c1 or king to a1. So in the game, king to c1 was played. If king to a1, it is a little bit worse because after black takes on c4, there is a pin here, so very devastating attack. Knight also attacks the, the rook on b2. So let's say if white tries to preserve this bishop, let's say d3, since it was being attacked by the rook on e8, black could probably just take, and let's just say we move the bishop again. 
black is just a little bit better because they are up a pawn, or they are up two pawns actually. So white has one, two, three, and black has one, two, three, four, five pawns. So it should be a clean endgame here. So that's why Barkazi chose king to c1 here in this position. And we could most definitely take our queen, take the queen, but if we do, white's gonna play this move rook to e2. And if we do a little quick count of the material, white has two rooks, a bishop, a bishop and a knight, while black only has a rook and a knight and bishop. So we're actually down a whole rook. So what we're going to need to do first is make an intermediate move, so an in-between move. So make a move that creates a threat before we make our obvious move, which would be wanting to take the queen. So in this position, black captures the rook on b2, attacking the king. And once the king deals with the check, so capturing the bishop, black can now capture the queen, delivering a check to the king on b2. And in the game, king to c3 was played. So king is now attacking the knight on c4. And if we try to protect it, black can play bishop to d3, and they'll be up a whole piece. So that's why rook takes e4 is played in the game. So it looks like material, minor pieces, and major pieces Y is, is pretty equivalent, knight for knight, rook for rook. But the pawn, uh, pawn count is just devastating. So white has one, two, three. Black has one, two, three, four, five. So a lot of pawns for black. So the game ended very soon. Knight to d4 was played. So trying to create some sort of interference blocking the rook from protecting the knight. So knight to d4, but after knight to b6, white threw in the towel because after knight to b6, it attacks this d5 pawn, which can hardly be saved. So even if white tries to play something like king to d3, there's a move like rook to e5, and then next move, the pawn is long gone. So. Uh, Black wins this game, Barkazi wins this game, and that showed that decoys can be a really effective tactic in order to gain full compensation and advantage as we saw in this game and the previous puzzles earlier. So thank you guys so much for attending Beginner's Breakdown and understanding the concepts of decoys with me and I hope you have a wonderful evening.